Bali in Indonesia, Bangkok, Phuket or Chiang Mai in Thailand, Nha Trang or Da Nang in Vietnam. We've all thought about moving abroad to some of these places. There's so many reasons you may want to do this. From simply basking in the sun all year round, to meeting people from all over the world, experiencing new and different cultures and food, getting in some self-actualization. But you don't need to be rich to do it. In fact, moving abroad to a lower cost destination can even make your money stretch further. Most people think moving abroad is too complicated and difficult, but really it's as difficult as you let it be. So here's seven steps for you to move to Bali or anywhere in Thailand or Vietnam really in a few broad strokes, smoothly and quickly, the big picture thinking stuff. It's all just my recommendations based off my own experiences traveling Asia, North America, Europe, Africa and living across Sri Lanka, Taiwan, Japan, Dubai, Vietnam and now Bali. But if you have good stuff to add or questions to ask, don't hesitate to leave them in the comments down below and watch till the end to get some tips on specific logistics and information about longer term visas here in Bali if this is where you're headed. When you think about moving abroad, probably the first question is where? <laughs> so this is really about narrowing down your top three choices, which in turn is about considering the different countries and climates that you can choose from and the lifestyle you can have there. After all my traveling and living in so many different places, I realized that personally for me, my non-negotiables for long-term living is stuff like hot weather, because I'm not a fan of winter, Asian food, because I love my spices, my rice and my noodles. <laughs> I need the beach and the surf, because those are my passions. And I like the vibe here in Asia the most, you know, and so on and so forth. Y'all need to figure out a similar list for yourselves because we're all unique and precious individuals who need that right spot out there in the world for us to actualize. <laughs> Best way to do that is through lots of travels to different places and more ideally, you know, do test runs. Get a taste of regular living, normal life, not vacay mode, and suits out the local vibes in various different foreign countries, ideally through studying, volunteering, or interning abroad for at least a couple of months. Why? Well, because imagination is often very different from reality and it will really suck for you to uproot your life to Ubud, set up house for a year and all that, only to realize that it's way too laid back and you really prefer the vibe of Changu much more. Or that you sign on to a job in Saigon for six months that you can't get out of, but six weeks in, you're already tired of eating furbo and banh mi for lunch every day, but there isn't a decent but affordable hamburger like how you like it back at home. And why three choices? Because Things change, or visa regulations change, or you change. And we gotta have a flexible mindset when we move abroad. So if things don't work out in one place, you just move on to another. And really, it's no biggie. But if you've already thought about it in advance, that definitely helps. <laughs> the second biggest question is probably, how will I make money there to get by? <laughs> Even if you have considerable amount of savings that can tie you through a bit of time, I think it's always good to have a backup income plan or two just as a hedge since, you know, the unexpected is always happening here and there. Anyway, if you're planning to be there for a while, it gets boring really fast doing nothing all day perpetually. <laughs> it's actually way more fun and engaging to be in your dream place and be productive and social at the same time. Which is why even though we are retired now in Bali, we still run around making YouTube videos. It's fun. We meet people. It keeps us engaged. It's great event. So, many ways to make money. Some people will think about looking for jobs in their dream destinations. These days, a lot of people also have the option to work for their employers remotely, which is totally awesome. Mm -hmm. Or you can start a business, perhaps even marry a local and start a business with your new spouse. Mm -hmm. Others yet may have skills like illustration or editing or web design that allows them to work freelance online, often through sites like Upwork or Fiverr, etc. Or even if you don't know these things, you can decide to spend time to learn them so you can earn a livelihood in your new place, kind of like what I did. I was formerly a lawyer, which is about as jurisdiction specific as you can get, but I wanted to live and serve in Vietnam in Mui Ne specifically. So I spent a few months brushing up on my skills and then took the IKO course and got my instructor's license and then started work at a new surf school. Bam! Livelihood in new place sorted. 
big drastic pivot in my life, but who cares? Made me really happy. Whilst we're on this topic, if you want to learn stuff like illustration, photography, or online content creation like writing and video creations, you know, digital nomad skills that will be great for working from anywhere, then you might be interested in today's video sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes on a huge range of topics, from photography and illustration to graphic design, freelancing, and more. The first ever class I ever watched myself on Skillshare was Sorel Amore's YouTube success, build an authentic channel that's worth the follow. Two years ago, when we first started this channel and was looking to improve, Sorel's class completely blew me away about, you know, the quality of her class, the skills I can learn and how it changed my mindset. To today, I still reference her advice about crafting a meaningful message when I'm doing my own videos. And she's still my role model in terms of successful, smart and genuine online creators. After that, we've gone on to learn so many other skills off Skillshare, like FCPX editing with Ali Abdal, which is another fantastic class, by the way, if you do video edits. So the classes are really good. They're adding new classes all the time. It's a really good platform to check out to learn new skills. Because Skillshare is sponsoring this video, the first 1,000 viewers to use this link in the description below will get a one-month free trial of Skillshare. So you can check out that class by Sorel I mentioned, or just look around Skillshare's entire class library for one month, absolutely free. How you choose to make money in the new place affects the entire logistics of your move because whatever you decide upon affects the visa you'll get and etc. So first up, be careful of all the many scams in this area. The work abroad scams, the love scams, they do exist. And the last thing you want is to show up in a new country preparing to work for a year or get married just to fly right back home without your money. General rule of thumb here is there is no free lunch in this world and if it seems too good to be true, it probably is, right? Don't you agree? <laughs> now, scams aside, there are lots of legit options available as long as you're willing to keep an open mind. One common way I've seen loads of people move abroad with ready work and happy experiences is through teaching English. Like in Japan, there was the JET program. Japan for English teachers. And in Vietnam, Thailand, and Bali, there are similar legit programs. Shout out to Ninja Teacher Academy based out of Ho Chi Minh City. You'll definitely need a TOEFL certificate or something similar. And in some cases, a bachelor's degree from a recognized university. But these are manageable obstacles. We live in a new age of digital and online possibilities now. So I've seen lots of people get by abroad through unusual or creative avenues like a girlfriend who serves and travels off the back of making handcrafted dolls and jewelry that she sells online via Etsy. Or another friend who illustrates children's books via Upwork and lives heavily in Yacheng in Vietnam. Basically, the sky's the limit in this area. So long as you're willing to be creative, to work hard and to try new stuff, all within the legal limits of wherever you are, of course. The third most important question is visa, visa, visa. How to stay in the place of your dreams legally for an extended period of time. Everyone knows visas cost money. Yes, you have to keep up with them. Just make sure you don't exceed the time limitations, otherwise you face fines or worse, jail time for overstay. But when we talk about moving abroad, please understand that it's not the same as immigrating to a different country. Choosing a place that will give you a visa for a year or two is a lot easier than finding somewhere that's going to grant you permanent residency rights. A lot of people seem to think any move abroad needs to be off the back of getting a PR or citizenship in that country. That means really long difficult applications, a foreign marriage maybe, or really splashing out to buy that citizenship as is possible in some places, which is totally unnecessary. These days, the world's really fast changing and mobile, so for most people, most of the time, any moves abroad, it's not for the rest of their lives. So then that makes the visa options broaden considerably. If you get a job in your destination, your new employer will sort out your work visa anyway. But this is generally just an option open to a lucky few. The rest of us can just look at where in the world it's easy to get long-term visas and narrow down countries that way. Recently, lots of top nomad destinations like Costa Rica, Croatia, Iceland, etc. introduced digital nomad visas, which is great and super convenient if you qualify for those. Like Costa Rica, for example, you need to show minimum monthly income of 3,000 US dollars, health insurance, proof you don't work for a Costa Rican company, and they'll give you full tax exemption on your income originating from elsewhere. 
sounds great. <laughs> Bali is supposed to be on the cusp of announcing its own 5-year digital nomad visa, but specific details have yet to be worked out and released officially, so we're all waiting with bated breaths. Thailand has just introduced its version of a digital nomad visa. It's a new 10-year residence visa issued to foreign remote workers who meet the criteria of being wealthy and or highly skilled, especially those in the tech sector. Vietnam hasn't announced any specific digital nomad visa plans yet, but they still offer tourist visas for up to 3 months and business visas for up to 6 months. So as I am aware, many people live for long periods there, bouncing in and out on such visas. It suits their desire to travel frequently whilst having a comfortable base somewhere in Southeast Asia. So effectively, their visa runs become timed opportunities for regional trips. Once you've figured out your destination, Google will give you the specifics of applying for the visas, stuff like if you need to start the visa process in your home country first, or can you just land with the necessary paperwork and it'll be processed there. It will cost money, but it's easy. And across all the places I've been through myself, I say, just do it through an established visa agency. There's so many of them because they provide a legitimate service. <laughs> It's just too much time and pain to navigate through visa systems in a foreign country, in a foreign language, yourself, without any local connections. So engage a legit visa agency to do it for you. This you can find easily with a Google or two. Here in Bali, longer term visas frequently used right now by most people are the B211 tourist or business visas, which allow you to stay here up to six months maximum. But right now, the B211 visas can be renewed without you even leaving Bali. So technically, on one B211 visa, it can stretch to like a year or longer with renewal. Or you can look at becoming an investor and get an investor kitas that goes on for two years. You can get more specifics from any Bali visa agency and they'll have the up-to-date details for you. Fourth on the list of considerations is do you know people where you are going? <laughs> Traditionally, this is a big one for many people. Starting a new life in a new country can feel very daunting. So having a friendly face showing you the ropes can make it seem all the more attainable. Plus, if they're from the same place as you and they moved abroad, that's just proof that you can too. But these days, to be honest, I'll say this is a good to have, but not an essential piece of the puzzle for starting out. Whatever specific issues you need to solve, Google will usually have the answer for you and often with more details. So for me, that's way more efficient if I have any questions. And at the end of the day, the drifters and the nomads in conventional society will always be outnumbered by the people who are perfectly happy staying put and building lives in the place where they were born. So where you will meet the most number of like-minded persons is whilst you're on the path of drifting and nomading, not before you actually get started. And the great news is that these new friends you will meet on your path are usually pretty open, pretty cool and fun, even if they may eventually turn out to be somewhat more transient friendships than that 30-year-old thing you have going on with your best pal from play school. <laughs> there are so many digital or regular nomad enclaves these days, which lead to many social or networking opportunities because people in the circuit want to actively meet one another, which means it's not going to be difficult to grow a new community of people around you in your new life if that's what you want. And birds of a feather always flock together. As little as Singapore is, and with only a population of less than 7 million people, there's always been a Singaporean community wherever I've lived. In Japan, in Bali, even in Dubai. So if you're from countries like the US, the UK, France or Germany, you're more likely than not to find herds of your own people in your new place. So knowing people where you're going is a good to have. But if you don't, not a showstopper. Just take heart and proceed. Number five is potentially an expensive time bomb, so don't forget to plan for this. And that is healthcare and having travel or international medical insurance. Healthcare is an essential service that we all never know when we're gonna need, but <laughs> universally, it's safe to say we can all agree it's an expensive pain in the ass. <laughs> Plus, when you need it, you really want it to be of an acceptable standard to you. 
So good news, across Bali, Vietnam and Thailand in my personal experience, I found most maladies and accidents can be comfortably and adequately taken care of in their hospitals and you can choose to receive treatment at either the local hospitals, which tends to be cheaper, or international standard hospitals like BIMC in Bali or the Franco-Vietnamese Hospital in Ho Chi Minh City, which of course will be more expensive. In any event, paying for healthcare out of your own pocket is a lousy idea. So you really want to get travel or international medical insurance that will cover you adequately. In this area, some potential providers are Safety Wing, Cigna or World Nomads. They all differ in terms of coverage amounts, scope of cover and cost of premiums. So you just need to check out and choose what suits you best. For example, Cygnus coverage is far more inclusive but pretty expensive. So personally, we switched to Safety Wing since many months back because that's what made the most economic sense for us. General healthcare here in Mali, for most issues that probably may arise, is affordable. So Safety Wing's coverage of 250000 under the Nomad Health Insurance seems sufficient. And we're okay to deal with the deductible of 250 US dollars. And for all that, its monthly premiums are really affordable at $42 per month. For me, I further maintain a hospitalization policy back home in Singapore that will cover me for serious illnesses such as cancer or other diseases. <laughs> so that if I wish to go home for medical treatment, this is an option that remains open to me. You may want to consider this as well. The sixth point is already down to the logistics nitty gritties flights, make sure you can afford them and then nail down a booking. Bank account, you want to have one that can service international needs or at least work for you where you're going or set up a new one in your new destination. You'll be surprised at the number of established international banks that will let you open a local account even without you having a local residency status. Before you fly, you'll want to set up a local mailing address or get your friends or family to agree to help take and pass on your mail or simply redirect all your mail to a PO box. Also, you want to cancel existing local subscriptions like newspapers, milk, whatnot. Getting vaccinated is also a must these days. And lastly, prepare backups of all the important documentation. I photocopy what I need. I also digitize all my records, like my health records, for example, so that if I need them whilst I'm overseas, it's easy access. So that may be something you want to consider. Lastly, number seven. What to do with your existing stuff from your current life now? If you're leaving home, probably you wouldn't want to keep on paying rent for just your belongings to stay there. And unless you spot a great job abroad that covers moving expenses and hired international movers, it's a lot easier and a lot cheaper to move with just a few bags. So, packing and finding storage is something you'll need to do. These days, storage units for rent like these are common and pretty affordable, so they're always a good option. But if you're committed to being away for a while, maybe you can consider selling or giving away at least some of your stuff. So the first time I moved to Japan for a year, and later to Dubai for two years, I brought my personal effects with me. You know, the books that I love, my existing clothes, my favorite teddy bear. Guess what? Big mistake cost me a lot to lug them all the way there and then I barely touched them, the books and the stuff because I was busy with new activities and I bought new clothes at my new destination that suited the local weather and the style better. So that was a lot of extra expense and effort for nothing. <laughs> so yeah, no need to follow in my silly footsteps. At the end of the day, stuff is just stuff. Life experience looms much larger. After you've read the books and played with your toys and moved on, maybe someone else can benefit from them. So that's my seven broad strokes for moving abroad quickly and smoothly. Let me know what you think, if I've missed anything out, or if you have something helpful to share with the rest of us. If Bali is your specific destination, then don't forget to check out our videos detailing how to set up life here in Bali on a budget, you know, budget travel, <laughs> or how our perception of life here in Bali has been after one year. Overall, most people I've met traveling and living across the world, we all agree that the career, cultural and personal benefits of moving abroad and experiencing the world outweigh the challenges you'll face living as a foreigner abroad. So I hope this was useful. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more content. Thank you for your support and I guess I will see you next Saturday. Bye!